little Jonah and we'll get a chuck. Come on, no one is looking. The book of Jonah. It's in the Old Testament. I'll help you. Page 1002. <laughs> 1002. Anyone there? Promise you, I'll give you a chocolate. Oh. Those who are watching as well, Jonah chapter 1. Anyone there yet? Yes, okay. Alpha has got a chocolate from me. I'll have to find out what your favorite chocolate is. Right. So when I say Jonah and the well, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Hey? The well. It's the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? What else? Oh. Okay, Jonah and the well. Another thing, okay? Right, there's a whole lot of things, a lot of stuff that comes to your mind. Who is this Jonah? Okay, why is the story there? And I mean, most of us know the story because we went to Sunday school or we watched it on TV or, or something like that. But we know the story of Jonah. But who is this Jonah? And, and why was there a story about it? I mean, even Jesus, when he talks to his disciples, we'll look on later on, even he mentioned and he quotes, he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the well, so will the Son of God be in the earth for three days, just like Jonah. So there's obviously something important about this really weird, almost like, you know, a okay, ridiculous kind of story, isn't it? So who is this Jonah? And maybe the question is, are you Jonah? Maybe you are Jonah. Well, let's read from Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from the NRV, so it's going to be a little bit different from the church Bible, which is good news, but the, the, the idea is still the same. One day the Lord spoke to Jonah, the son of Amittai, and he said to him, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and speak out against it. I'm aware of how wicked his people are, Verse 3, Jonah, however, set out in the opposite direction in order to get away from the Lord. Let's stop right there. In another version, the ESV, the English Standard Version, it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So, I mean, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine Jonah sitting somewhere. I don't know if he's sitting on a rock, or he's sitting in the streets, or sitting in a nice coffee shop in, 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 in Judea. And um, all of a sudden, he hears God speak to him, and he says to him, Go! The interesting thing about that word go in the Hebrew and it's the word kum. And kum means get up, rise up. Okay? Kum means not just get up, but get up to do something. Rise up to do something. In other words, it's a movement. It's going somewhere. Okay? And God, as we read, he says to he says to Jonah, he says, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now Nineveh is about 600 kilometers from where Jonah is at present, it's 600 kilometers due east, okay, past Syria and sort of in that direction, the edge of Syria starting into, into you know, deserts and so on. And this is what God is sending him, he says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and why? Because I want you to speak out against the people. The people obviously in Nineveh were evil, were wicked. God says, I think in your version it says, I I've seen the problems there. What does Jonah do? He goes in the opposite direction. He goes to Tarshish. Now a lot of people will say that Tarshish, and I think the good news, says he goes to Spain. Now Spain is 3,000 kilometers in the opposite direction. Okay? What, what, what is Jonah doing? Jonah is completely going, not just the opposite direction, but let's go as far as possible from the presence of God. 
Now, why does Jonah want to go away from the presence of God? You see, the word presence in Hebrew, and you know, when, when, when you read the, the story of Jonah, and you are able to read it in the original language, it's so much richer. Because the word presence in Hebrew is the word panim. Say panim. Panim. Panim means towards, in the presence of, or face. So literally, God's face is looking down at Jonah, sitting there, and he says to him, Kun, rise, don't just stand there, start walking, where? To Nineveh, in that direction. What does he do? He turns his face away from God, away from the presence of God. He turns his back to God and goes in the opposite direction. As far as possible, he goes in the opposite direction. Why? I mean, turning away from God, God's face is turning on Jonah. Imagine having God's face turning towards you. How wonderful, how good would you feel if you know that God's face is turning towards you? God's desire for Jonah is to walk in his direction. Just like he said to Abraham, also Abraham was sitting somewhere sometime and he said to him, get up, rise. Where am I going? I'll tell you where you're going. Just start walking. And we know the story. He asks does God tell people to, to go. We go in the New Testament. What, if, what in the New Testament happens? Jesus comes to these fishermen and he says, come and follow me. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where they were going to get the food, where they were going to sleep. They followed him. Isn't that what God does? He says, follow. He said, wait, I don't know. Just follow me. Trust me. It's about trusting God. When I was asked, what's the first thing that comes to you when you hear Jonah and the whale? My answer was, stop running away from God. That's what the story means to me. So Jonah rose and he turned in the opposite direction. Let's carry on reading verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish or to Spain in the orbit, he says, from the presence of the Lord, from the face of God, he knew. He went down to Jonah and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid a fare and went to dive into it to go with them to Tarshish. Away, he says again, away from the presence of God. Verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest of the, on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they herald the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and he had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean you are sleeping? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps God, your God will give, uh, will give up, will, will, will help us, will save us, that we may not perish. Verse 15, So they picked up Jonah and carried him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its rage. Now if you look at this passage, it tells us, the writer tells us that there is this downward movement. I mean, he went down to Jopa, he went down into the boat, in the boat he went down to the belly of the boat, and he was thrown into the sea. They were down into the sea. The writer tells us that there is this downward movement, and Jonah is going to end up down at the bottom of the sea, and eventually down in the belly of a fish. Everything is down. I mean, think about it. He started off here, didn't he? He started off doing whatever he was doing, and he you know, obviously had a good relationship with God because God speaks to him. He listens. But then what does he do? God wants to face him, and God's face is upon him. He says to him, I want you to go in that direction to Nineveh. We will do something in Nineveh. He says, no, I'm going to go to Spain. I'm going to go as far as possible from you. I'm going to turn my back to you, God. So what happens? He goes down to Jericho. 
And in Ujoka, he goes down to the boat. And in the boat, he goes even further down to the bottom of the boat. And eventually, where does he find himself? In the bottom of the sea, down in the belly of the fish. Down, down, down. What happened? Everything started going down the moment he turned his back to God. The moment he decided to go in his own direction, there was a downward movement. And isn't that so true in our own lives that when we somehow don't want to do what God is doing, when we, when we turn our face away from God, where is the direction? Our direction is only down. You show me a person that turns away from God and they're having a wonderful life. God is calling and He's saying, Come and follow me. Put me first. Start your day, this day, start your day with facing me. Today is Sunday. It's the first day of the week, isn't it? Monday is the second day of the week. And aren't we privileged as believers in Christ to have God in our first day of the week, to start our week with God and God turning His face upon us. And as we carry on the rest of the week, we should be inviting Him and says, God, we want you to be in this day. I'm going to walk, not down, but I'm going to walk forward. I'm going to look in the same direction that you're looking. If someone is in need of something, I'm going to do the best I can to help that person. Because I'm looking in the same direction as you. You know, when I, when I do counseling for, for people who want to get married and so on, what I say to them is, you know, marriage is not just about sitting in a nice restaurant, looking all googly at each other, all romantically at each other, face to face. That's the easy part. The difficult part in marriage is to look in the same direction. Isn't it? And God is wanting us to follow Him and look in the same direction. He said to Jonah, He's saying to us, I want you to start your week. I want you to start tomorrow when you go to your workplace. I want you to look in the same direction as I'm looking because I want you to see what I see. God is calling us to come and follow Him, to make Him the priority, to start with Him. But then Jonah turns away. He turns away from God and he goes down and down and down. Doesn't this represent what we sometimes do with Jesus? Eh? This, is a, this is Jonah's story. But the question is, isn't that our story today? One of the great things that I feel that that has happened after COVID. I mean, yes, COVID is still in our midst, but fortunately we're not as locked down as we were. I really pray that eventually we'll have to be freer from the masks and so on. But what were the last two years about? Two, three years about? I mean, was it just, just like a blimp on the map of our history? An irritation? Or was it maybe God turning His face towards you and forcing you toward, to turn your face towards Him and look together in the same direction? Maybe God wanted us to evaluate and prioritize few things in our life. Maybe God was telling us, you know, do we need the church or don't we need the church? Yes, you can have church at home. You can watch me like those who are going to watch me today. But what's missing? Fashion is missing. Being in the house of God is missing. Being with people is missing, isn't it? And maybe just maybe the last few years, God was telling us something different. So this is what goes on in chapter 1 of Jonah, okay? But chapter 2 then happens, 
and something different happened in chapter 2. And, and then Jonah, it says that Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. And this is what he says. He says, I call out to the Lord. This is chapter 2. I call out to the Lord out of my distress. In other words, out of with this place where I'm finding myself down there because I got myself there. And what does God do? He answers me. He says, He answered me out of the belly of fish. I cried and you heard my voice. Of course you did. Why? Because God's face is towards who? Towards us, isn't it? For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and a flood surrounded me. All your waves and all your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight. No, Jonah, you decided to walk away. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. In other words, I'm going to look upon your face again. The water closing over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. So they're like, woe is me. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land whose bars close upon me forever. Yet you brought my, me up. My life from the pit, my Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regards to vain idols forsake their hope and steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. And the Lord spoke, verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish. The Lord spoke to the fish. And it says, I love it, it vomited. It vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So what, what, what was happening then? What, what was happening with Jonah? I mean, he was in a downward trajectory. I mean, he was, he was here. Then he went down, and then he went down, and then he went down, and he found himself right there in the pit of a... You can't go lower than you, you, you are in the, in, the, in the belly of a fish. <laughs> I was growing up, I always had a picture in my mind of Jonah making a little fire inside the well. You know, eventually the well, the smoke was getting to him that he coughed Jonah out. <laughs> You know, but I mean, I mean, he was down, desperate. And what happens? He prays. But what's another another thing that happens? He repented. He repented. And what's repentance? What's another way of repentance? Huh? You know where the best example of repentance is? Is in the army. Who who has been to the army? Come on. I know your stories, I know you've been to the army, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Now remember in the army when you get there and you get told you're going to learn how to march and so on, and the sergeant comes and says to you, okay, stand, and uh, you, I don't know how to do it in this country, but you sort of like shoulder to shoulder, and you sort of had to do this, distance from the other person, so when you march you don't kick him where the sun doesn't shine, okay? And then he says, okay, turn, and you turn, right? What do, you do? what do you turn? Okay? And then it says, March! And you go, one, two, one, two. And then the sergeant goes, about two! What happened? You turn. And what do you do? Marching that direction. Okay? But you were going in that direction. So what happens? The sergeant changes his mind and he says to you, about turn, turn. You were going in that direction, now turn and going this direction. That's repentance. Jonah was going in Tarshish way. Jonah was going in that direction. God said, no, you need to go there. You need to go east about 600 kilometers. You don't need to go 3,000 kilometers west. And in a way, God says, okay, you're not going to listen. I'm going to get someone to make you listen. Fish, listen. And he goes in about turn. He realizes and he turns. He says, I turn towards him. He's now looking at God's face. 
And there's an about turn. Not following his own direction, but the direction of God. Looking in the face of God. Repenting. That's what Jesus talks about when he, when he tells us to repent. Now, we can leave the story right there and say, well, the book of Jonah is about a disobedient prophet, right? But if we had to ask Jonah, how did you get to the bottom there? How, how did you get from there to there? Down, 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 down. I think he will say, well, because I was deeply disappointed in God. He didn't do what I thought he was going to do. And I'm really, really, really disappointed. The reality is that we can land up on the bottom step because of poor decisions that we've made, just like Jonah did. But we can also say it's because God made poor decisions as well. I mean, how many of us find ourselves at the bottom at the moment because, you know what, God, I wanted this and you didn't do this for me. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. How many of us have given up? And how many of us haven't given up? Doesn't matter how low you, you, you go, do you give up? Or do you look in the same direction as God does? If you're on bottom, what God should do? If you're feeling like you're a Jonah, sitting there disappointed in God, what God should do? Was it your poor decisions? Or is it that God didn't do something for you? He didn't intervene for you? Let me share another story about another guy. And this is in Matthew 14, 26 to 31. If you want to turn there, Matthew 14, 26 to 31. I'll just give you a few seconds to, to look there. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were afraid. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. He said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Notice it says Peter got out of the wall, out of the boat, and walked on the water. Jesus wasn't the only one walking on the water. Peter was walking on the water. But then, verse 13. But when he saw the word, he was afraid, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught, caught him. You are of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the word died down. And those who were in the boat whispered and said and worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. So there's another story of someone in the boat sitting there. And, 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 and Peter and the disciples are sitting there. Um, you know, they probably moved from one direction, one, one part of, of Galilee to another part of Galilee, and, and uh, they were wondering where Jesus is. And they look up and they see someone walking on the water. I can't even ski on water. <laughs> Never want to walk on water. But they saw someone walking on the water, and of course they were terrified. I would be terrified. Have you seen someone walk on water lately? Okay. I'll be terrified. And of course, Peter, being Peter, he says, well, if it's you, just tell me to come and follow you. And, and, God says, and, and, and Jesus says, yeah, come, just come, get up. And that's why I, I think we all underestimate Peter and think, oh, yeah, well, the whole story is about Peter sinking. But he said that Peter got out of the boat and walked. The other 11, where were they? Still in the boat. Probably still terrified. Probably still thinking he's a ghost. But Peter got out and he said he walked. But what happened there? What was he doing? I mean, picture this. He's getting out of the boat, okay? He's now, yeah, 
He's not standing, balancing. He's walking towards Jesus. But where is his face? Where is Peter's face? You owe me a pizza. <laughs> I haven't had a pizza for a long time. Thank you, John. <laughs> The longer it carries on, the bigger the pizza gets. <laughs> but where is Peter's face? Looking at Jesus, isn't it? So he's looking at Jesus. And Jesus says, come, come, come. Remember when our children first learned how to walk? What did it do? The legs, let, the legs. Let. And he said, come on, look at me, look at the mommy, look at daddy, come, 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 walk. And, 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 and the do and the sort of, and then they're like, oh, <laughs> you know. But then look at, at, at your face. And, and, and Peter looks at Jesus in the face. But what happens? He looks, he, he takes his eyes off Jesus' face and he looks around and he sees the, the waves and he, he probably sees all the disciples going, Are you crazy? <laughs> and he doesn't focus on God. He turns his face away from God, just like Jonah did. Why? Because he doubts. And what is doubt? It's unbelief. Doubt is going back, still marching in the one direction, and the sergeant says, Halt! About turn! And you know, I want to go in that direction. For those who've been in the army, what happens if you disobey the sergeant? You see that tree with that leaf? Go and run, fetch me that leaf. And you come back and say, Not that one, the one next to it. No? What happens when you move away from God, when you're not going in God's direction, when you doubt, when you look at the circumstance? You've heard me say that a hundred times. Christians should not give an answer how you're doing by saying, under the circumstances, I'm doing well. No. Regardless of the circumstances, I'm doing well. I'm looking at God. I'm walking in the direction of God, I'm facing God, and I'm walking in that direction. I'm walking in obedience. So what is this to us? When you follow Jesus, when your face is in the direction of Jesus, then His will is made perfect in your life. Look at another story. We'll end with this. John 21 verse 7. John 21 verse 7. The disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And here's Peter again. And there's Peter sort of like, Who is this guy? And said, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Now what's happening in that story? We have Peter again, and again Peter is just sitting there, probably in the boat, doing what Peter does best, and fish. I don't know how good he was at fishing, but uh, those who watched that clip know what I'm thinking about, okay? If Peter somehow always needed Jesus to help him fish, okay? But Peter is there with the disciples. What has happened? Why are they back in the boat? Why are they fishing? Is because this is after the resurrection. Jesus is dead. Okay? As, as far as they know, Jesus is dead. He didn't rise from the, from the dead. Okay? What is Jesus doing? He's in the belly of, of the earth for three days. Okay? Now remember what Peter did before Jesus was arrested. What did Peter do? He denied Jesus three times. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, you the Galilee. No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not from Galilee. Yeah, you, you were with, No, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know this guy. Three times he denied Jesus. So you can imagine how Peter is feeling at that moment. Okay, the last thing he wants to do is to do, to go fishing, but he does because he goes back to what he's doing. Jesus, according to him and the other disciples, is dead. And then. Jesus doesn't walk on the water this time because he knows he's going to scare him, but he can't. I mean, like, I know he's dead and he's not standing there. And the same to Peter, he says, Look, he is. But Peter now better knows to walk this time on the water. Okay? So, what does he do? He jumps in. 
And there's a weird thing that, that, that it says there, and, 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 and John tends to add things to it. And it says there that he wrapped himself with clothes. Now, when you get into sea or a pool or whatever, and you're in your swimming costume, and you want to go out swimming, are you going to put your clothes back on? No. Okay? You're going to take the clothes off and jump in with your swimming costume. So why does Peter actually say that he put his, his thing on, his garment on, and he runs and he runs and he starts swimming. And he swims to Jesus. And this is so beautiful. They had breakfast together. They had breakfast together. Now, I don't know about you, but I like breakfast. Especially when it's bacon and eggs and, and those kind of things. Tomorrow, my mom is visiting. Tomorrow, I'm going to have breakfast with my mom. I'm going to have a bacon and egg. I'm going to. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. And that's what they had. They had breakfast together. It says, it says he jumped in. And the story is, is it hangs with. Jesus having breakfast with Peter and the disciples, and this is after the resurrection. Isn't this a wonderful picture? And, 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 and we expect that okay, Jesus is going to reprimand Peter. Does he do that? What happens after he has breakfast? He calls Peter aside. I can imagine Peter going, Oh, I think of thunder. And Jesus says to him, Peter, yes, Lord, you love me. <laughs> Lord, you know I love you. It's sort of like doing this. You know, please don't say anything about what I said to you about the other day. I think that you, he said, second time, Jesus, that I appeared to you. Like, yes, Lord. More than anything, you know I do. <coughs> and, and then he says to Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter says, oh, with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, Jesus, I will do anything for you. And what does he say to Peter? Go and feed my sheep. Remember, this, this is Peter, the one that Jesus says, I'm going to turn you into a fisher of men. He's not just going to look for fish in the sea, but I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to get you to talk to people about me. I'm going to get you to take them out of the depth of where they are at because they turned their face away from me. And I'm going to get you to teach them how to turn their face towards me, because Peter, I know you know how to turn your face towards me. You fail, but you know the mistake you made. You walked on water, Peter. I know you love me. Feed my sheep. Tell them that they need to look in the same direction as I am. Tell them, Jesus, that they need to have that face turned to me. There's a story told about a husband who had lost his wife. And a daughter who had lost her mom. After the funeral, some of the close relatives noticed the pain of the husband. So they asked him, Do you want us to take your daughter away for a few days so that you can have some time to breathe by yourself? And the man replied, No, we are going to face this together. We're going to look in the same direction. So that night, as the father was putting his daughter to bed, she cried out, Daddy! Daddy, it's so dark in here. May I sleep in your room? And of course he replied and said, Yes, my darling, you may sleep in my room. And as they went into the father's room, he turned off the light and his little cry, girl cried out. She said, Daddy, it's so dark in here also. The father said, Yes, my baby, I know it's dark. And the little girl said, Daddy, it is darker than it has ever been before. The father replied, yes, my little girl, it is darker than it has ever been before to me also. In the darkness, the little girl, he asked, Daddy, yes, my girl, do your face turn towards me? The dad said with tears in his eyes, yes, my sweetheart, it is turned towards you. She said, Daddy, I can go to sleep now. Good night, Daddy. After the little girl went to sleep, the father, who was in such despair at the loss of his beloved wife, fell down on his knees at the bottom of the bed and asked, God, God, is your face turned towards me? 
we heard a gentle voice saying, Yes, my son, my face is turned towards you. The father turned up and he says, Okay, my father, I can go to sleep now. Good night, my dad. You can make it through any situation, any situation, if you face it with the father's face towards you. Towards you. It might be dark where you are right now. It might have got even darker. But guess what? The Father's face is towards you. You have asked God, it seems you're a million, million miles away. I can't even feel you. I can't see you. And it is so dark at the bottom where I am. Is your face turned towards me? Let me show you today the face of the Father is turned towards you. And you know what? When you look at each other's eyes, whether it's your wife or husband or your children, there is a certain intimacy. Like, there is a certain vulnerability, isn't it? And if you notice kids who are naughty, they don't want to look into your face. My mom always used to say, look at me, look, look at me. And I used to like, no, look at me. And they want you. Because you could tell anything if I looked at her. I still now sort of dodge my mom's eyes. <laughs> but you know what's amazing about this word intimacy? It actually means into my eyes, you see. That's what our Father wants to do with us, is have that intimacy that when He looks at us and when He asks us to follow Him, no matter what the circumstances around us is, that when we set our eyes on Him and look into His beautiful face, then everything, everything disappears, isn't it? And just like Peter, we'll be able to step out of the boat walk in the direction of where our Father wants us to walk. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's thank for the benediction.